Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Candidate Forum on Education. We will start the program with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Mullaney, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters for Appleton, and also the state president for the American Association of University Women. The Appleton branch is of, uh, and of the League of Women Voters um, have correlated, or collaborated, I'm sorry, uh, with the Fox City's Advocates for Public Education to organize this forum for this evening. So we have three groups representing us here for this. Judy Goodnight, just walking in right now, is our AAUW branch president. And you will also be hearing from Jim Bowman, the coordinator of the Fox City's Advocates shortly. I want to express my gratitude uh, to the volunteers from all these groups that make this event possible. All three organizations are nonpartisan. We want you to understand that. We do not support or endorse any candidate or party. However, each of us has positions and perspectives on particular issues and we are advocates for those issues. One of those issues is the importance of public education. We thank you for your interest in this forum and your support for the democratic process. Participatory government requires informed voters who make their voice heard at the po poll booths. You may also be interested in another league-sponsored event. Uh, Dr. Arnold Schober, who is an associate professor of government for Lawrence University, is speaking on kind of a mixed uh, title of uh, Elections, Candidates, Substance, and Personality. And they, we have a flyer, can't get here, just a second, um, out on the table um, for you to pick up. Um, and this will be uh, Wednesday, October 12th at 6.30 in the Public Library, Appleton Public Library. We want to also thank the candidates, John Powers, Sharon Woz Wozinski, uh, Sam Kelly, Jim Steinecke, Bob Baker, Mike Rokes, uh, Marion Stout, and Dave Murphy for being here this evening. Uh, Robert Coles and Ron Tussler were not able to be here this evening as they had a conflict for the stage. You are willing to run for office and serve your community, and for this as citizens, we thank you and are grateful. Tonight, we hope to have at least some of your questions answered. The League of Women Voters has a couple of starter questions, and we invite you, the audience, to write any questions you have on note cards and pass them to an attendant, and you'll see some of them standing up. Um, they will also have extra sheets if you still need room to write a question. Um, <clears throat> these are collected as you fill them out. Um, just hold them up, and the collectors will come around. There are League of uh, Women who uh, pursue the questions, or peruse the questions, and before they're sent forward, they're not to eliminate any questions, but rather to kind of group them um, so that we can get through as many as possible. Um, at this time, we have a short introduction to the education issues by Jim Bowman. He's the coordinator of the Fox Cities and Advocates for Public Education and a current member of the Appleton School Board. So I will invite him down. Thank you, Chef Payne. There's a, a one-page handout that uh, covers what I'm going to show you on the uh, on the screen, but it's a little, a little easier to see the handout. Did anybody not get the handout, the one-page handout? Would you hold your hand and keep it high? set the stage for the forum. The background that I'm going to provide will help you consider and evaluate 
the remarks that you're going to hear from candidates. I'll update you on four public education issues. Funding for the K-12 schools, special education, school choice vouchers, and the achievement gap. My comments have not been shared with any of the candidates. Let me preface the four issues with the sentence in the Wisconsin Constitution that authorizes K-12 schools. It reads, quote, the legislature shall provide by law for the establishment of district schools which shall be as nearly uniform as practicable and such schools shall be free and without charge for tuition to all children between the ages of 4 and 20 years old. Now the four issues. They are also referenced in your handout. Number one is school funding. Candidates elected to the next legislature will vote on the 2017 to 19 budget that determines the funding for Fox City's public schools. Let's briefly review how this funding system works. It begins with state revenue. The revenue comes from a variety of sources, principally income and sales taxes. Revenue can decline in years in which the economy is not strong and when the legislature has reduced taxes. The amount of revenue is on the minds of legislatures when they put together the biennial budget. This budget will be a top priority for the next legislature when it convenes in the spring. The primary source of funding for the six Fox Cities school districts is state aid. State aid varies between districts based on residential property value. Districts in which the property wealth per pupil is low are less able to raise funds through property taxes. They therefore receive more state aid. Property rich districts, on the other hand, receive less. The amount of state aid provided to each district is determined by an equalization formula. On average, Fox City school districts get 54% of their funding from the state aid. The second largest source of funding is local property taxes. 36% of school revenue comes from this source. The diagram also addresses voucher payments to private schools, and I'll get to that later. Again, the two primary sources of funding, state aid and local property taxes, account for 90% of funding for our schools. This graph displays the average funding per student in the Fox Cities from those two sources. The amount displayed for state aid includes all categories of aid. The legislature limits the sum of state general aid and property taxes with a revenue limit or cap. The purpose of this revenue limit is to contain property taxes. Each district has its own revenue limit. When the limit was originally conceived in the 1990s, it was intended to be raised each year at about the rate of inflation. In recent years, however, this practice has been abandoned. Revenue to school districts has therefore not kept pace with inflationary growth and operating costs. To adapt to this shortfall, school districts typically cut spending by deferring maintenance, increasing class size, and cutting programs. At times, they have also frozen staff salaries, but this practice jeopardizes their ability to attract and retain the best educators. Now let's move on to issue number two, which is special education. Currently, funding for special ed falls short of costs. Let me explain. Special ed means that we educate students with special needs in a way that fits their individual needs. These special needs include disabilities that affect learning, communication, emotions, and behavior. Consider, for example, dyslexia. It undermines a kid's ability to read, write, and spell. A dyslexic child at age five might still speak in baby talk. He might mispronounce words so that spaghetti is pronounced pisgetti. An animal becomes amenol. 
While others in his class move ahead, the dyslexic kid falls behind. Kids with dyslexia need a teacher, tutor, or a therapist specially trained in multisensory structured language approaches. State and federal law require that local school districts provide special ed and related services to kids with disabilities aged 3 through 20. Statewide, 14% of our children have these needs. Since these kids need more individualized instruction, the teacher to student ratio is reduced and the costs per student increase. Aid for special ed from the state, however, covers only 26% of these costs. School districts currently struggle to fund the special ed services that their kids need. Issue number three is school choice vouchers. Vouchers are available each year to 1% of public school enrollment, about 365 kids in the Fox cities. The intent of the legislature is that eventually all students will be eligible. In the Fox Cities, vouchers are exercised at four private schools and two private school systems that have registered for this purpose. All of these schools are religious. Based on statewide experience, 75% of new voucher students will not exercise choice. They already attend the private school to which they will now provide a voucher. Only 19% transfer from a public school. The diagram that you see shows that each year the cost of vouchers is taken from the school district funds. Then the school board has the option to recover the lost funding by temporarily increasing its revenue limit and increasing local property taxes. Because Fox City school boards were unwilling to reduce services to their students in this last year because of vouchers, five of the six districts compensated for the cost of vouchers by increasing property taxes in the 2015-16 school year. The original goal of Milwaukee's voucher program created in 1990 was to improve achievement Studies by the DPI, that's the Department of Public Instruction, by the Nonpartisan Legislative Audit Bureau, and by school choice supporters, however, have found no difference in performance between voucher students and public school students. The Milwaukee program also shows that voucher schools do not enroll special needs kids in significant numbers. The result, special needs children and the costs of educating them are more concentrated in public schools. The controversy now centers on parental choice and cost rather than student achievement. And some legislators are asking questions. Senator Luther Olson, for example, chair of the Senate Education Committee has stated, quote, the question is, what is the purpose of this program? Is it a program to help poor kids get out of public schools? Or is it a program to pay for the tuition of kids who are already in private schools? Close quotes. A related issue is accountability. Requirements for accountability to taxpayers are not consistent between public schools and voucher schools. Voucher schools are not subject to the state's open meetings or open records laws. Voucher schools do not receive school report cards, nor are they included in the state's accountability system. Voucher schools are not included in the state's educator effectiveness system, and their educators are not required to be licensed or certified. Public schools must meet all of these requirements. And then finally, issue number four is the achievement gap. The achievement gap is the persistent disparity of student outcomes between groups defined by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, and gender. This disparity exists in standardized test scores, grade point average, dropout rates, and college enrollment and completion rates. The achievement gap between lower income and higher income students is not confined to the United States. It is worldwide. In Wisconsin, the achievement gap is not limited to Milwaukee. 
It also exists here in the Fox Valley, where the populations of lower income families and minority students are increasing. Research suggests that schools, life at home, and the local community all influence school, student outcomes and contribute to the gap. Home and community influences are particularly significant because students spend more time at home and in their communities than at school. The issues that affect children in poverty, one parent families, for example, lack of role models, inadequate medical care, poor nutrition. Those issues also undermine learning and they accompany kids wherever they go. State Superintendent Tony Evers says that many techniques that have reduced the achievement gap come down to meaningful relationships between educators and students and between the school staff and parents. Now you're up to date on four issues. Thank you so much for your attention and let's uh, proceed with the forum.